Tony, we still have a Sky Report to cover. Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Okay. So we'll start with the early evening sky. And in, in the early evening sky, we, well, we can see there's Jupiter, Saturn, Mars. Also, earlier in the evening is Venus. And um, so on the 15th, be sure to look, look because the, that really bright thing next to the moon will be the planet Venus. One thing I should mention that is up until... Uh, that time between between now and about the 20th of uh, July, there's also a bright uh, object to the lower right of Venus, which I didn't show you early enough. You have to look about half an hour after sunset, but that's the planet Mercury. It's actually unusually easy to see right now. Now, this is a, a drawing by a Professor Paul Abel in uh, England, and he's actually been here to do sketching of planets, but I thought I'd show you a very recent sketch that he made of Venus. Venus typically doesn't show much in the way of detail. I think your first impression would be that it looks silvery and featureless. But if you look really carefully for contrast, you can see these faint bands. And those are actually patterns of clouds. Now you might think, well, you could draw in anything. And quite often, sketches don't match what photographs do. But actually, these perfectly match uh, ultraviolet images that were made at the same time from other parts of the world. So I mean, there was no conspiracy. But uh, I think he actually did a very skillful job in this case. I uh, also notice it's, it's gibbous. Towards the end of the summer, it will look much larger in, in, in a telescope and actually be crescent. Jupiter, this is just a recent view. Jupiter's up uh, as soon as it gets dark. It's probably the best time to look at it. We're featuring it through our telescopes right now. And um, so here's a recent image and, and the beautiful red spot, which you can see about once every three, three nights or so. I usually announce on the uh, Sky Report, uh, which you can reach uh, on our website, um, what nights it's visible from Los Angeles. Uh, here's a recent image of Saturn. Right now, it's uh, it's highest in the sky about midnight, but you can see it uh, from the early evening. And uh, this is a view by Damien Peach from Chile, and we'll be seeing more of his pictures. And uh, it, he picked up a storm uh, near the North Pole of Saturn. Um, the moon... Uh, phases this month uh, makes the best time, like if you want to go on star parties uh, this weekend or the following weekend. But is the anybody a member of the between. Astronomy Club of Akron here? No. <laughs> no. <Nobody's laughs> no. The reason I say that is if you want to see a be beautiful Milky Way, of course you have to get out of the city to do it. And it's best to do that when the moon's not out because the sky lights up the, you know, the moon lights up the sky. So um, weekends you know, amateur astronomers with telescopes usually get out of the city and go on their star party. So if you belong to an astronomy club, you probably have a place to go. But otherwise, it's like national parks or monuments, Joshua Tree, for instance, is the right. nearest now, one. Now, in this month, there's a couple of things happening with the moon. That's right. That um, and so uh, notice that we have a new moon coming up on the 12th, our, our time, and uh, 13th universal time. Uh, that will result in a, in a uh, solar eclipse that we won't be able to see from here. But however, if you book, book a flight really quick to the east coast, eastern hemisphere coast of Antarctica, oh. you might be able to see an eclipse that covers about a third of the sun. Wow. <laughs> so get your tickets now. I think uh, Patrick's acting as the travel agent tonight, and he'll be happy to stay <laughs> late for you. All right, well, if that's not enough for you, this month also has the longest lunar eclipse of the century. It's long because the moon goes clo clo or through the center of Earth's shadow, and it happens close to ap apogee when the moon's farthest from the Earth. And we can. Yeah, so we can't see it here. However, I'm sure someone will stream it on the Internet, so mm -hmm. you'll probably be able to see it somehow. But it, it would be straight overhead if you're just off the coast of Madagascar. <laughs> ah, well, that is a lemur. From well, of all the luck. Yes. So. <laughs> okay. Now, a very rare thing that's happening in with Pluto, uh, kind of a weird thing. Back in a year after it was discovered in 1931, it passed through the node of, of uh, the ecliptic. In other words, it passed through the Earth's orbit. Um, it will happen again on on July 12th. It will pass through the node one more time. If you were on Pluto. You would, if you had a telescope, powerful, and this would have to be an enormous telescope, you could actually see the Earth and Moon crossing the Sun's disk. Now, there is a significance to this. Uh, some astronomers think that, like Saturn's rings that light up 
when they're uh, directly opposite the sun, Pluto may have some kind of opposition effect too. So uh, there will be photometric uh, measurements made to see if Pluto has an unusual brightening right at that time that's directly opposite the sun. Okay, and then uh, uh, later in the month, the planet Mars will be at opposition. That means it's opposite the sun in the sky. And that's when it, it's very bright. And it will also be the night that the moon is at opposition, same night as that lunar eclipse. Um, the opposition full moon is the full moon. So you'll see a full moon right next to Mars. Now Mars actually comes a little bit closer to the Earth three days later, three nights later. So basically the morning sky only will have Saturn uh, because Mars will set right about sunrise. Um, this is how Mars has changed over the year. Um, on July 31st, it'll be at its largest. It will be 24 arc seconds wide. Now that might sound impressive, but <clears throat> like if you look at the moon and you're familiar with the crater Tycho, well, Tycho is about 50 arc seconds wide, so it's only half as big as that in a telescope. So you need pretty high power to see details on, on Mars. But we only see those details about every two years when Mars is opposite the sun. This is an especially good year, one that, a kind of opposition that only happens every 15 years when Mars is near its closest to the sun, its perihelion, and Earth is at its farthest from the sun, its aphelion, which as we told you happens today. Mars actually will be uh, nearest to the sun um, in, in August or so. It'll be later but but it comes it's pretty close to our timing so the distance between earth and mars is only 35 million miles and uh, that's about as close as it gets now it can get a few hundred thousand miles closer other significant things is the tesla roadster will also be near its uh, farthest from the sun but notice it's not quite caught up to mars it won't reach mars so now normally this would be a great time to view mars you're giving us hints but that that's storm. right. So yeah. what's that, how's that going to affect our view? That's right. Well, um, we'll go back to the end of May. This is, you know, the features on Mars were very easily visible, even though Mars wasn't at its biggest yet. But this amateur astronomer in uh, in uh, Puerto Rico picked up this yellow storm, and yellow on Mars usually means dust being kicked up, and uh, so. That, that very quickly spread across the planet. Here's a, a drawing by that same Paul Abel I mentioned just a few days ago showing um, uh, the same face of Mars. And all we see really are clouds around uh, a region called uh, Hellas. But all those other dark uh, features are just ghostly uh, through, the, the, through all that dust. So we might not see very much. Uh, here's that same face of Mars, but this is uh, back uh, just when the dust storm started and before it spread. So you can see beautiful detail. In the, this is a Damien Peach image showing craters even on, on the surface with a one meter telescope in Chile. But uh, this is, the, this is uh, Clyde Foster in South Africa with a view just uh, very recently of that same face. And, and this is actually the same night Paul Abel made his drawing and you can see Hardly anything's visible. And finally, <clears throat> the, the face of Mars facing us at Griffith Observatory on the night of the uh, 30th, morning of the 31st, when Mars is at its closest to the Earth, is this side. This is the feature of Valles Marineris, which is a uh, huge canyon on Mars. So it's an interesting feature. A lot of these things are very high. There's also volcanoes, which you can see the uh, very faintly visible in this view. But they're, they're extremely high altitude. Some of those are, uh, uh, I can't remember, the 15 miles, I think, above the average radius of Mars. But now, all you can see, really, are those volcanoes, these three dark spots picking, picking, poking up partly through the dust in the, in the north polar cap. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry, the south polar cap. In any case, not very much visible. Here's a recent view inverted so that North is on the top uh, by Damien Peach. This is a film that he made of the uh, obscuration. Now, it looks like it gets better right at the end, but Tony It's said, just cycled, yeah. Yeah, so you yeah. said today actually the latest is it's still not. No, it, it doesn't look very hopeful. Unfortunately, dust storms tend to reinforce themselves.